Uh, welcome to the first panel on uh, Sunday morning here at SPX. Uh, I'm going to make some very brief introductions, uh, but try to make, make as much time as possible for the cartoonist to talk, because uh, that's what you're here for, not to, not to hear me uh, talk. But I will also try to ask questions. And I, I try to run panels sort of like a conversation, so I may I may wind up having something to say, too. I, I suppose in some ways I am also a cartoonist, so <laughs> maybe I can say something. But uh, I, I will also try to save a few minutes, uh, maybe 10 minutes or so at the end of the panel for questions from the audience. Um, when you get ready to do that, I believe they will have microphones set up in the aisles. So if you have a question, as it, if it turns out that you have a question that we have not addressed by the time the Q&A opens up, um, seek one of those microphones just so that you get picked up um, in the audio for the um, recording that's going on. Okay. So I will, I will, like I said, very briefly introduce um, the cartoonists who are here at the table, uh, just moving along the line from uh, from my right or your wait from yeah from my right your left over. Uh, and uh, mostly, I'm going to do the introductions just by holding up recent books. Uh, or by pointing to recent books because uh, my copies have migrated down the table in a couple of instances. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say a word or two and then, um, like I said, try to get things started. Um, so immediately on my right is the Danish cartoonist Rege Veladsen, who has a book uh, translated, by, uh, translated and published by Fanographics uh, called The Sea. It's a really interesting uh, book. Um, full of some sort of dark, surreal images and uh, things like that. If you have not seen it, you can go by the Fanographics table and take a look later. Um, to her right is Eleanor Davis, whom many of you will have heard of, who has a brand new book from Drawn and Quarterly called The Hard Tomorrow that I strongly recommend. But you may also know her books, How to Be Happy, or uh, is it You, a Road, and a Bicycle? Or did I get them in the wrong order? What is it? It's you and a Bike and a Road. You and a Bike and a Road. Right, so, but Eleanor has a number of really good books and uh, The Heart Tomorrow is excellent. Um, to her right is uh, Kevin Heisinga, whose Ganges comic has recently been collected by Drone and Quarterly as The River at Night. This represents several years of work. Um, much of it is about trying to fall asleep and not falling asleep and what happens when you're not falling asleep. <laughs> it, 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 it's much more interesting than that sounds, <laughs> because as you know, if you've struggled, if you've struggled with it, you know that uh, uh, things go on in your mind. But how to represent those in comics is a is an interesting problem. And then I, my copy of uh, Simon's book is down there with him, I think. Or no, here it is. Yeah. Sorry, it made its way down. Uh, Simon Hanselman uh, has a new book called Bad Gateway, also from Fanographics. Um, and feature, which features his recurring characters, Meg Mog and Owl, which I suppose are his now, really. Uh, but they started off as uh, children's characters or ch children's book characters. Is, well, I... there's a children's, I mean, it's a long story, really. It's a yeah. children's book series from the 70s. But it's not really a pastiche or a edgy reboot. It's just, <laughs> right. I, I have a witch and a cat, and I, what will I call them? I'll name them after these old 70s kids books I grew right. up on. And, if they were called Megan and Michael, there'd be no problem. <laughs> so, yeah, it's nothing. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> well, no, no, they're, his, they're his characters, and, and um, I'm sure he'll have more to say about them, but the, the, this is a sort of further investigation of uh, things get, it's, things for Meg, Mog, and Al keep, or I think Meg and Mog, anyway, keep getting more and more serious, it seems. Yeah, it's about addiction, depression, yeah. being alive. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, they're starting to get older and, uh, feel the effects of years of, you know, chronic self, uh, self abuse. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny though. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's brutally funny. <laughs> so, um, when, when Rob Clough, the organizer of the um, panels for SPX, uh, asked me to moderate this panel, each, each of the individual cartoonists, I thought, wow, I'm really excited to talk to that person. Uh, in, in, in front of people and ask them some questions. And then I thought, ha, but ha, what do they have in common? Why, why has Rob put these folks together? Because their, their work stylistically, uh, thematically, uh, even in terms of tone, is pretty different. 
Um, and it took me a while to understand what Rob saw them having in common. Now, the title of the panel is Hard Thoughts and Visual Metaphor. And I think when Rob says visual metaphor, he means something along the lines of using, um, using something visible or visual inside the comic, not necessarily real in the world of the comic, but a thing that you, can, that you the reader, can see uh, to try to describe or explain something that is hard, difficult to describe, or something that's invisible in the world of the comic, some way of like, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, and the thing that, the example I use when I'm teaching graphic novel to, to college students uh, often is there's a, there's a recurring figure in Craig Thompson's book, Blankets, that's sort of like this paisley thing, or like a little sand dollar that just appears around them when this, it, it, and the thing that it represents is sort of like the holiness of the soul, but there's never any words on it. There's never any words describing it, and as you read, you gradually come to understand what he means by it, but because it's hard to describe, it's a hard to describe thing, he just improvises a sort of a symbol in his cartooning for what, um, for what he means. But I, that's not, that, like, that's a kind of narrow definition of visual metaphor, like coming up with a symbol to describe something. And actually, the, the thing that I started to see connecting the work of these four cartoonists is broader than that. Um, and I had a hard time trying to describe it. I still have a hard time trying to describe it, but I'm going to try briefly and then ask if maybe the cartoonists would like to offer some refinements based on the way they think about their own work. Um, but I think uh, often there are these hard to describe or kind of ineffable thoughts, or thoughts is maybe even the wrong word because they don't come in words necessarily, feelings maybe, intuitions that are very hard to that would be very hard to write, to write down, and are similarly very hard to draw. And sometimes they come into the work of these cartoonists in the form of what you might, what I've kind of started thinking of as a kind of casual surrealism, this sort of permeability of the real world by, uh, by things that aren't really in the world of the comic. Uh, images or symbols that are in the, not really in the world of the comic. We can think of them as like, I guess visual symbols, S symbols in the sense of like literary symbolism. Here's a thing that means something. And I, I feel like calling them surreal is almost a disservice because when we're talking about, you know, surrealist painters or something like that, uh, surrealism means uh, the feeling of meaning without any real meaning attached to it. Dali, when he does a surrealist painting, doesn't mean for you to think something particular. He just wants you to have the feeling that you're in the presence of meaning. But I have the feeling that when, they, when they're bringing in these unreal elements, they, they're meant to mean something. And that is actually something I see as a connection between the four of you guys and something that makes your work different from like a, a typical autobiographical cartoonist or a cartoonist who's uh, mainly doing sort of fantasy adventure-y stuff. This attempt to reach for uh, meaning in a way that is almost hard to label or describe, to put into words. But um, I don't know if I've got my finger on it yet, that thing that, that I see connecting your work. And I'm wondering, if, uh, I'm wondering if any of you guys can do a better job, or if what I just said doesn't make sense relative to what you do, or if there are elements in what I said that resonate for you. Did that, that question make sense? Let's, let's talk. <laughs> Well, I'm pretty sure we're all on this panel because it's like the odds and ends panel of special guests and they just cobbled <laughs> us all together. That's the short answer. We're all on this panel because they didn't really know what to do with us otherwise and they tried to apply a title to it. That's the, it's more than that, really, though. there's no connection at all. <laughs> it's only an imaginary connection? No, I think, though, that it is a thing that... I mean, I, I read all the new stuff in really rapid succession uh, this week and... I don't think I was hallucinating this, this similarity. Like, I can see it, but it's, it's not in tone or in uh, content or in style. It's instead in this sort of approach to, like, how serious are the comics? And what kind of seriousness are you pursuing? Do you know what I mean? Um, I, I think that something that all uh, four of us seem to have in common is that we don't tell the reader what to think. Mm. Um, 
that we try to lead the reader to uh, the conclusion that we're, we're uh, providing for them. Um, and, and that automatically leads to, uh, it means you have to use more, more metaphors and, uh, and have a gentler approach. And that does certainly apply to my work, fly on the wall, kind of, you know, squalid and just, you know, dirty and real and just about life. You know, it's not insensitive, but it's not super censored. It's just, you know, so yes, that is something we have in common. <laughs> We all draw with pens. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, um, one way to think about this, uh, this element that I'm trying to describe is that it has to do with um, kind of enigmatic moments in the, in the books or things, that, things where um, the reader kind of has to puzzle for a second about what, what it means. Um, do you think do you think you need to be enigmatic to be serious about meaning? Is that too weird a question for this hour of the day? <laughs> well, I think uh, I think you're, we're searching for something special that's not really that special because, like, uh, good artists, good storytellers, there's lots of enigmatic stuff, you know, and it's not like most stories are like very straightforward and. It's not ending, man. You know what I mean? So I don't. I am having a hard time thinking about this because I'm like, this is just something that's true of all art. I, yeah, I think you may be taking it for granted though, because of the way you think about what you make. Like, I think there are lots of people who would tell a story without <laughs> thinking for a second about uh, those parts, the, the unexplained. You know, without like they, they just say, well, this happens and this happens and this happens and there it is. Like what? Like a. I don't know, like a Drew Barrymore rom-com or something? <laughs> like, is that what we're talking about? Where it's just like, you know, straightforward thing? Like, yeah. will they be together or will they won't? Will she oh, take yeah. the job? If, you're, if your interest is in job? plot, if your main interest is in plot, then you don't need to necessarily be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, it's not as if a plot can't be meaningful, right? Like plots, sure. they reach their conclusions and they do something, yeah. they say something. There's a big white whale. That's usually kind of enigmatic, yeah, that's though. Enigmatic. The whiteness of it is... For sure, that's like <laughs> textbook, I guess. A metaphor or whatever. Yeah, a visual yeah. metaphor and a non-visual text. I personally try to make my work as clear as possible. I don't want to confuse the reader or leave any room for them to really interpret it themselves. I don't trust them. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. I don't think I'm trying to be weird in a, or like confuse the reader. It does so, Kim. It confused me. <laughs> I mean, I think that happens because of whatever... Yeah, it's out of my control. I, actually, I mean, I, I'll speak for myself to say that, like, I, I am trying to uh, make it, keep it interesting for myself by, like, not really knowing what I'm doing. Because that was I think the other I'm half pretty, of the question, I think. I'm pretty left-brained or whatever, where I want to, like, nail it down into a system, so I'm always trying to push it in a direction that's a little bit uh, unexpected or like, um, like I didn't see that coming or something. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, I think of that also as just like good craftsmanship of storytelling or making art where you would want to surprise people or take them in some direction that they didn't see coming. Uh, I don't know. I think um, maybe the uh, great thing about working is that you can surprise yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm not really considering how this is going to lead the reader into uh, answers or anything. Um, I'm kind of uh, diving into it and see what uh, will emerge and needs to be uh, entertaining for myself and surprising as Kevin said. Um, and sometimes you just fall in love with an idea that you don't know really what, what's the sense of it? Does it matter? It just has, has a feeling uh, and uh, something to it that is not predictable. And if you go with it, uh, maybe it will slowly uh, come forward 
uh, something, a direction, or something that you don't know yourself, and and that's the privilege, I guess, of uh, being creative and and make stories. Is that uh, if you trust in intuition, maybe you actually somewhere something will emerge that you didn't suspect or expect. Mm -hmm. I think that's well put. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because, I, I mean, maybe I'm asking the questions I was asking because I'm coming at these works from the perspective of a reader mm -hmm. and wondering, uh, you know, what does this mean after it's all finished? And you guys must mostly encounter that question, what does this all mean, as you're in the process of making it, that you've done something that, has, that makes intuitive sense or that, um, is, is there kind of to keep things interesting or to keep things open. And as you, as you work toward the end of a story or toward the end of a book, you have to resolve those things. You have to, or you, you have the impulse. I mean, not, maybe not every cartoonist would, but, or not every storyteller would, but you have this sense of like, well, what, is, what in the end does this thing that I liked partway through the process, what's it for now as we get toward the end? And that, that's a, you know, Readers have the same sort of question, but it's after the book is finished, and it's and the answer's there to the extent that it's going to be there. Mm. I just you know, I just think of my work as entertainment. I hope people like read it on the train or on the toilet, and they have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not your your work is not just making jokes. I mean, there's there uh, it's yeah, it's deeply it's, therapeutic. It's about my yeah. hardcore junkie mother and my squalid upbringing and abuse and uh, self-loathing and it's brutal. But you know that's where the best comedy comes from. But, you know all that dark stuff that happens. You have to process it somehow. But you know you have to have a laugh. Yeah, it's a comedy. Life's a comedy. Yeah. It's not that deep. Yeah. Not my work. <laughs> you know, I'm very self-loathing as an artist, very self-flagellating. Like, I think you have to be sort of, you know, hard on yourself and, you know, beat yourself up. But it's also like Reggae was saying, it's this beautiful journey of just figuring things out. And mm. I think something we have in common is we all sort of do it for ourselves. Like we're compulsive and we just be doing this no matter what and processing these strange thoughts. Yeah. Um, when I um, wrote The Sea, um, I got pregnant mm. and... Uh, didn't really know how that happened. <laughs> so, and we, so, I, so can in, explain it later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in the story, there's a woman uh, walking around at the beach, and there's a light tower, and they, I guess this is the strongest symbol in my book. Um, it, it's the strongest metaphor. <laughs> it's it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty overt. We were looking at it before. Uh, before the paddle started, uh, there's a, there's, there are moments with this woman in the lighthouse when visually there, you can't escape the sense that the lighthouse represents something. Um. <laughs> oh yeah, she's having sex with the lighthouse. So. <laughs> and that explained to me how I got pregnant. <laughs> but at the end, that same woman reappears in, in, a, in a way that I, I, was unexpected to me. I, I didn't understand why she had been in the middle of the book, but when she came back at the end and she says, we can put the baby in here and now the, the story can end or the tale can end, that, that's, that's a kind of resolution that makes sense of her existence in the middle of the book too. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's as if um, at some level, whether deliberately or not, you have to resolve those things for the reader and they start to mean something and not just be ideas or images or, I don't know, I feel like I'm chasing this around in a kind of odd way. Um, it's so uh, good when you don't understand things and you keep like searching a, and what does it mean? <laughs> like a, a bear who's chasing a, I don't know. <laughs> you're trying you to do a metaphor. A, you need a visual metaphor you're a for, big the, guy. for the pursuit. Yeah. Yeah. Or a, yeah, a dog shaking a bone until it, what? I don't know what they're doing. That, why they do that? No. Um, worrying the bone. Um, I wanted to ask uh, whether you think the culture of comics reading makes it hard for you to to it, like to ask the reader to do things as seriously as some of you are doing. You know, like to to. In other words, 
Is there something about comics culture still? I think it certainly would have been true in the U.S. a few decades ago, but do you feel there's still something about comics culture that makes people take the books less seriously than you mean them, or that is there something you have to do in order to invite the reader to to sort of slow down and think? Is there a way to manage that to to make the reader uh, go seriously or um, or to understand that there's something going on here, do you do it on purpose, and how? Um, I guess that whenever I uh, write anything, whenever I make a comic, I have a very specific feeling that I'm hoping to get the reader uh, to feel. Um, and it's not so much a matter of uh, you know, getting it or not. Uh, but that's my job, is that I've had a feeling, a strong feeling, and I want someone else to feel that feeling too. And uh, comics to me are, are, are a vehicle for transferring a feeling from myself to another person. Um, and then after that, it's all tricks. You know, you use different uh, tricks and techniques and, and visual metaphors, and uh, um, in order to, to try to say, well, if if I can, if I show this event happening in this specific way, and if I make this panel this large, and then the next panel that large, uh, is it going to? You know, it's like music, where where. Uh, it, will that be successful in in drawing forth this feeling? And then you, you fine tune it. You fine tune it. You say, well, that that makes you have a feeling, but it's not quite the right feeling, or it's off the mark. Um, what are some of your tricks? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anybody who's read comics or who's drawn comics and, and thinks about it very hard can see. You know, like, like a a larger panel takes longer to read, and it reads as a beat. You know, it it reads as a longer passage of time, or uh, as uh, having greater import. Um, you know, so that's just a trick. It's just a a, a technique. Yeah, to, there to are moments use. in Hard Tomorrow where you have uh, like silent splash pages where there's just just two pages of or a single page where it, there's no dialogue, and that does take a while, and you have to take them in visually, and they pick up a kind of emphasis yeah, that way. Yeah, I, I think that that has a, a to me, that has a, a, is more representative of my own um, experience of life, which is that uh, time is not, time doesn't pass objectively. Uh, some moments grow heavy in your mind, you know, or, or stick in your mind and have weight and you can you can symbolize you can you can communicate that with a a, a larger panel or a, a heavier drawing um, and hopefully manage so like uh, there's a um, splash page in, in my book of uh, of a man holding a, a friend his friend has handed him a gun and he's looking at the gun in his hands and it's a very big splash page, and it's super high detail, uh, as, as detailed as I'm capable of drawing. Uh, you see every line in his hand and the, the light glinting off the gun. And that was me trying to sh help the reader have the same feeling that I felt when a friend of mine handed me a gun. And I, that, that memory has stayed very, very sharp in my mind, the weight of it. You know, and uh, I don't remember anything else about the rest of that night. I think we talked about uh, outcasts, outcast, and uh, music, but and it was you know it just all washed away with time. But the the feeling and the memory of of holding the gun um, was so strong, you know. So trying to to hand that feeling to the reader. Uh, that was my job. It occurs to me that, um, first of all, it occurs to me that I could probably find that page and hold it up, not that you'd all be able to see it, 
But um, it also occurs to me that because of the scale of this book, which is not very big, and because of the scale of the drawing, which is quite big, you're almost literally putting the gun into the reader's hands. Nearly. That like at the point where you're holding the book, you're sort of holding the gun. Um, that's that's potent, you know. And of course, you guys in the audience can't see the rendering here, but there's a lot of fine detail. There's a lot of fine lines. Well, you have to buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> I'd recommend it. Uh, but also, there is a lot of uh, white space, mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, like the. Uh, Leaving white space can create like uh, this uh, mm -hmm. kind of a, mm -hmm. a feeling of yeah, like a, a hole. Vacuum. Yeah, vacuum. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, this is certainly not the only way to stop it, to make a reader stop and think, but it works. It's it's functional. So. It reminds me of um, <clears throat> it reminds me also of that autobiographical bus trip story and uh, how to be happy, where. Uh, I guess two pages happen in a grid that's something like four by five. Mm -hmm. So very small panels and not very much detail, pretty thick lines. And then you turn the page and there's a two page splash of what look like uh, God's hands coming down out of the sky over the Texas, the West Texas desert. I'm starting to get kind of nervous about how often I use the metaphor of giant hands. <laughs> and I think that people will start to notice and, and call me out on it. Be like, you can't just keep on using that trick over and over. <laughs> But um, there, there have got to be other ways to, to sort of slow the reader down and get them thinking. Um, no, that's the only, only thing. <laughs> I've tried. Nothing else works. Well, I guess then we're done. <laughs> <clears throat> um, <laughs> but I, I, part of the reason why I think of that is because, uh, like, Simon, you stay pretty locked into a, uh, a grid for yeah. most, of, most of your comics. So you manage uh, pacing and time in a really different way like you're not gonna hand the reader a big splash page in order to slow things down in a moment, but you do slow things down. Yeah, yeah. I just like fluidity. I just want people to be able to engage with it. Like I loved what Eleanor said about just trying to take a feeling and, and pass it on to the reader. So yeah, I'm just trying to go for fluid pacing and trap people in there. Well, I want them to enjoy it. But the, the panels, the structures, it is like prison in a way. It sort of represents also the, you know, I worked 3,764 hours on my book last year. Yes, Reggae, yes. It's, that's a, if you do the math, that's a shocking amount of hours. So it really was, uh, it was, it was quite brutal. Uh, so yeah, I, I feel sometimes like the panels, the, the, the same 12 panel grid, it's just I'm locked into this repetitive pattern of endless, endless work, wrapping my hands in bandages so I can pick the pen up. Yeah, I work hard for my readers. And I want them to have a good time. I couldn't help, I was cracking up down here silently to myself before. If someone had walked in sort of three quarters of the way through your talking, Eleanor, you sounded like a gun nut. You were talking about like, the, the gun, oh, like the gun. gun, you hand the gun and they touch the gun. <laughs> Yeah. That's what guns make you, that's how they make you feel. Yeah, out of context, if someone had walked in, they'd be like, oh, this is like an NRA meeting or yeah. something. <laughs> yeah. But it's not. <laughs> but I really like that in, in uh, I feel like that with your work, Simon, the, um, the subject matter is so hard and out of control. It's horrible. That the, the, it's the off yeah, that the that the that the grid um, that you use is uh, it's like a stabilizing effect. It like brings yeah. the story uh, into like an undeniable reality. Well, it can certainly represent the monotony of the lives that mm -hmm. these characters lead, and what they're doing to themselves, mm -hmm. and and a, and yeah. a kind of um, predictability in the rhythm of the page that that keeps things from feeling totally out of control. Yeah. You know, there's a kind of, like I, I've, I've, in reading your stuff, I often feel a kind of comfort when the, there's a story beat that ends at the end of the page, and I'm like, okay, may, maybe the story's over here. And, and, I, and the characters aren't gonna, like the characters, it's not gonna get any worse for them. Because mm -hmm. yeah. the, the story has ended. And then, <laughs> and then there'll be a little single, one panel that's given over to the title of the next story. This happens actually in Bad Gateway. There's a moment where there's a, a title for the next story, but then the, the narrative continues right from the same moment. Yeah. And it, it actually was like mildly upsetting to me. Like, really? Yeah, like I'm it's sorry. just gonna get worse. 
<laughs> I thought that was resolved. Well, of course, all their own problems in a way. I mean, well, yeah. I'm, I'm delving into this psychological portrait. It's, you know, it's a very deep book, but yeah. Mostly it's just a bit of fun. But, yeah, but really, regarding the panel stuff, I'm kind of just lazy. I mean, doing big layouts and splashes, it's quite tricky, doing like triangular panels. And well, well Kevin, you do all sorts of folding, time-breaking panels, and you're very experimental, which, you know, is not something I do at all, I think, you know. I think we, exper we try to experiment with time in a similar way, maybe, and convey certain things. But yeah, you, you are very experimental with your panels, but I am lazy. <laughs> you'll, you'll see in, in uh, River at Night, there are panels where Glenn Ganges is sitting on the edge of the panel, looking down into the panel, and, and yeah. thinking about the time in the panel. And it makes me uncomfortable to hear about that. It seems so terrible. It's brilliant, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. Uh, I, it's very, this is going to be an or, uh, a disappointing thing to say, but it's just intuitive. I don't really, it just seems like, okay, this is what I'll do, and I'm not thinking about it too much. That is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the silliest Kevin thing Heisinger, I've ever heard the, you say. Kevin the cartoonist who doesn't think. Doesn't think. Doesn't yeah, that's think not, that is just not work. true. <laughs> well, that's what, it feels like that. <laughs> <laughs> to me. Like, I don't feel like I'm actually, like, have a bunch of different choices, and then I'm, like, weighing the different choices, and I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. This you know, or something that's like, well, oh, this is like a spiral, so I'll make this a spiral. You know, the, this like this moment reminds me of last night uh, at the, the Chris Ware and Eddie Campbell thing. Chris Ware briefly said, well, I work really loose. <laughs> and I thought, what? Yeah. <laughs> Sloppy. <you know>. No. <laughs> um, we are going to need to wrap up in just over 10 minutes. And if you have any questions for these cartoonists, whether mm -hmm. particularly about an individual person's work or especially about connections, if you see them, um, it would be great to be able to take a few questions from the audience. Um, I will give you a second to think about that. If you move to the mics, uh, they're in the aisles. That way, um, I mean, I guess if you wanted to ask, and I could repeat it for you, but you could also go to the mic either way. Go ahead. No, the mic is going to come to you. Oh, no, is it? It's not. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So, so he's asked uh, if you guys could talk about um, when you uh, use close-up uh, close, close images and faraway images and zooming in perspective and zooming out perspective as a way of focusing attention. Um, like wh how often or when do you think about how tight the, the focus is? Is that a question you want to field? It's just intuitive. You just I mean, me personally. It's just however I feel. The beats of the story. When do you you know go hit the emotional moment or whatnot? It's like being a film director. <laughs> Staging. When I write, I do kind of like perform in a way, and it's like a play. And I'm, I'm embodying all the characters, and we're talking to each other, and it's quite visceral. But, uh, it's like a stage play, treading the boards, and you try to put it onto paper. That's, don't get me started. <laughs> I think a fun thing to look at is uh, the difference between French comics and uh, manga. And I don't know why this is, but I feel like with French comics, they hardly ever zoom in. It's uh, um, often uh, it's the little figures kind of live in the panels. Yeah, you can see their feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, a lot of the time. They're, yeah. they're uh, um, long shots. And, uh, and with manga, it's you're right up in the characters' faces all the time. Mm. Um, and the the emotional difference between, on average, between uh, French comics and, and Japanese comics is so different. It's very, uh, I think of French comics as being a lot more, having more distance and being more story driven. And with the uh, Japanese comics as being very much more about emotion um, and not exactly interiority, but, but definitely character character driven right? yeah feeling so -driven. like yeah, it right. projected emotion more than interiority yeah especially maybe shoujo manga yeah. more than, than shonen manga kevin well no i, I want to talk about it but without valuing one thing over the other but like uh i yeah i associate there's like there's a certain kind of comics and especially teaching comics you see this with students where there's a certain kind of comics where it's just faces and faces and faces and faces all the time faces and shoulders 
And then there's even a subset of that where it's eyes, 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 eyes. Um, and then, um, and I see how that, like there's kind of a, an easy sort of drift in that direction when you're drawing a comic. But I've always liked comics and I've always liked tried in my comics to fight against that and always try to push the camera back and show just the body and even to try to hide the face if I can and to try and I feel like there's a one of those paradoxical things where you project your the reader projects onto that more so than if they're like there's a big face and eyes in their face though I think that's also a different way to to do it and there's different effects over time of like reading page after page after page of, of faces and big heads versus like just bodies and in space moving around and the acting with the body and stuff like that. But uh, I've always preferred the trying to do that. But then every once in a while I look at my own pages and I see that I'm drifting towards bigger heads and a lot of heads. And so then I try to. I don't know, balance it out, for sure. It, it, I think there's also something about the influence of early newspaper comics. Like, the, the, the period in <laughs> newspaper comics in America where they were really almost trying to do vaudeville. Yeah, uh, and so they, whole they're thinking about, like about the stage pre camera, Pre-camera, yeah, proscenium yeah. Uh, visual storytelling where it's a, it's a stage setup versus the, when the camera logic starts becoming the... And I feel like... We now, when we think of a visual narrative, we can't help but see a TV style of visual narrative where there's cuts and there's close-ups. And even when there's like people talking to each other, they're like very close to each other. And that's all like TV logic, you know? <laughs> yeah. It um, is, it is, yeah. TV yeah. logic. And I, I think some, some, sometimes you get like, there are all these rules. Uh, to making comics, the panels, for one thing. And sometimes you get stuck in it and you get bored with it. And then, oh, I do, I always question those rules. Um, like uh, my latest book that someone uh, has a, something gets out of her mouth. Uh, weird thing. Vomit? Oh. Yeah, it's a bit like that. And then another person asks, is that a speech balloon? We actually don't consider why the speech balloon is <laughs> so <laughs> dumb, actually. <laughs> uh, as a shape uh, in, the, in the picture. And I, I just had to question that. Uh, yeah. Was that anything? <laughs> that was not a real answer. <laughs> it's, it, it's interesting though, because uh, a lot of the a lot of the language of comics is uh, inherited and unquestioned sort of uh, uh, conventions of visual metaphor. If you think about it, the speech balloon is a visual metaphor too. Mm -hmm. It's just or a visual symbol, uh, like that Craig Thompson one that I mentioned at the beginning of the hour. But it's, it's so conventional that we don't think of it as being anything but just standard comics procedure. Exactly. The panel border and the, the layout of panels is also uh, a visual metaphor mm -hmm. for, you know, well, let me represent a set of moments uh, next to each other so that you can read them. Mm -hmm. so we, we um, you know, at a certain point, you, you lose enough of those or question enough of those and what you're making may not exactly be comics mm -hmm. because we're used to that as part of the language of comics, mm -hmm. but also, um, you know, you wind up wondering about those things or questioning them or interrogating them a little bit or changing them a little bit or deliberately making a little variation, you know, obscuring part of a speech balloon to make it clear that there's noise covering up what somebody's saying, for example, or putting the speech balloon in a slightly different shape to indicate that somebody's drunk or depressed. You know, there are ways that you can manipulate the visual metaphors that we inherit yeah, try not to think about it. I've got deadlines, just got to keep on doing it. It's, speech bubble's all right. I can't redesign it. I tried to make a better one, I can't do it. It's pretty solid, just stick with it. It's pretty convenient. Yeah, got 10 hours to get something done. And I can't have no sleep tonight. Um, is there anybody lined up to ask one more question? I think we can just do one, and pretty quickly. Um, so, I don't know all of your like exact career tra trajectories, but um, as people who do like somewhat 
unique artistic comics that make you know sort of nebulous statements. Um, I'm sure earlier in your careers, it's like you might have found uh, difficulty uh, sort of getting you know like people to um, trust that your comics were like like this on purpose or you know you might have gotten feedback like this thing doesn't make sense or something like that <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering like uh, if if you did have any kind of issues like that like getting people to like get on board with it when it's kind of unique um, and if so like did you get any feedback that you thought was terrible or was actually good and how did you differentiate between somebody who didn't just didn't get it and somebody who like actually did and and you should probably listen to them like <laughs> your thought process like when you were in your early stages of your career um in my case i try to only uh i i ask a couple different people um for feedback and uh, just pay attention to them because if you try to get feedback from a whole different a, a large group of folks then then it's a too many cooks situation and uh, you're going to end up with something that doesn't work for anybody uh, so you just have to trust that if you can make something that works for these one or two people your ideal audience uh, that it will also work for for other folks as well um, and uh, sort of an answer to your first question uh, i think especially I, I was just reminded of, um, especially starting out, uh, if you're making complicated work that's a little confusing, that, that is, is meaningful, or is the intention to be meaningful, uh, and especially if you're a woman, you'll run into people who will tell you what your work is about. They'll say, that's so cool that, I bet you didn't realize this, but this, in this story, uh, it could mean this and this and this, and you're like, yes, I, I wrote it. <laughs> that's, that's why it's like that because of that I wrote and drew it. <laughs> so uh, don't 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 listen to anybody except for your two or three trusted folks. That's my advice. Uh, I tried it once. Uh, that was uh, the sea again. My debut, and um, I did. I wanted to do a sailor, and I showed it to another artist, and he said. <laughs> That's not a sailor. That's a fisherman. <laughs> and actually, so that's in the book now. Yeah. So what to do with that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, the sailor or fisherman starts <laughs> arguing with the reader. What? Whether what he's he, a, fail, a sailor <laughs> yeah. or a fisherman. Yeah. So I kind of took it into the book. <laughs> His comment. Uh, never done it again. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I I think confidence is very uh, fragile, and you want to keep that. And so you don't want, if, you, if you're asking other people because you don't, you're not confident, that's one thing, but you also don't want to like ask other people about something that you are confident in and then they take away your confidence or they mess with your confidence. Um, I, don't think, I don't think there's that much useful feedback that you get, um, except from people that you maybe trust and even they you should have an understanding with each other about what you're looking for and what they can and can't you know what i mean um i don't and it depends i think a lot on your attitude of whether you want of you're confident or not if you're confident in it i think you're just fine and you should just plow forward and then what you hear back enters in as a little bit of information that you can adjust by but, um, like, I don't know, like, I'm going to, like, I taught art at an art school for a while, and, and, you know, I'm sure some of you are art school people. The whole th critique where everybody has a lot to say, and da, 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 I don't know. I don't think that's, <laughs> I think it's a lot of waste of time. And it, um, yeah. But, uh, my, uh, my high school principal, he banned me from selling my zines in the playground. <laughs> And he said, you can't do this, you can't self-publish something. And I was like, this is like the Riverside Gazette, a local newspaper that's self-published. Like, of course you can. I've seen zines. I know what they are. So I dropped out of high school. <laughs> <laughs> kept doing it. And, and now my Megan Mog books are in 15 languages. And I'm going to Italy next month. So, Mr. Fagan, <laughs> you know, what's he doing? He's a school principal. He just didn't get my work. So, you know, I didn't listen to his criticism. 
<laughs> you know, I was an enterprising young business person. <laughs> you know, an entrepreneur. Yes. Yeah. He should have seen that in me and, you know, nurtured it. Yes. Yeah. He was wrong. Although maybe what he did was best for you because by trying to ban you, he's got you, he's given you a nudge. He set me on my path yeah. to this, you know, cult-like, weird <laughs> comics thing. It's kind of like Scientology, seriously, get out if you can. I've been stuck in this so thing some, for about 20 years. I've been trying to get out, please. Sometimes genuinely bad criticism can be uh, very useful as a, when you don't, when you, when you push back against it. I, yeah, I read so my Goodreads reviews. I read them. Everyone says, don't read the comments. Don't read your own reviews. I read all of my own reviews at like four in the morning. And, and sometimes there's good criticism. Sometimes it's like, oh, I don't agree. You just didn't get it. It's not for you. That's you did okay. say earlier sometimes that there's a lot of self-loathing in the comics. That <laughs> yeah, sometimes such incisive criticism. You actually really learn something about yourself, something you hadn't seen in the work. And it's, it's, you know, it's set my work off in, in different ways sometimes. Uh, I recommend read all the comments, read all, you know, <laughs> self-reflection. We, we need to wrap up, but I have one very brief question for each of you, which is just if you could quickly tell the audience where they can find you today if they want to get books signed or uh, if they want to buy things from you. What's the time? Uh, it's uh, one nineteen right now. So in uh, 11 minutes, I'm going to sign at the Fentographic booth. Uh, it's W50, I believe. Yeah. W50, <laughs> Fentographic's books. Next to the ATM. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eleanor, do you have a signing schedule today? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm bringing up my phone so I can see if I can find it. Um, I am, if you want to get my book, The Hard Tomorrow, uh, my new book, it's at uh, the Drawn and Quarterly booth, which is W1. And uh, I'll be there, and I'll also be at my booth, um, J10, and at the Fanographics booth. Uh, and yeah, so I'll be signing at John Quarterly from 1 to 2. No, that's yesterday. <laughs> Sorry. I'll be signing at John and Quarterly uh, right after this, if you want to get my book. I believe I will as well awesome. at John and Quarterly right after this, I think. At some point, anyway, yeah. Yeah. And Simon, are you Pretty at... Pretty soon. I'll be at Fanny Graphics Books at W50 at 4 o'clock next to Ed Piscor. My books are also available at hopefully the local library. And uh, you can get it on Pirate Bay. <laughs> so will you guys uh, join me in thanking the panelists for...